This is a disclaimer that while discussing this case, we present a lot of our opinions, and our opinions are just that, opinions. They are not facts. Welcome to another episode of Ectoplasm and Evil. Ectoplasm and Evil, let's go. Super exciting. We're on a roll. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep on the roll. Yeah. Olo's going in to get his follow-up x-ray tomorrow. Yeah, we're four weeks post-op. Yeah, so if you've been paying attention to the podcast from the beginning, then you know that he's had his surgery. Yeah. And that we got to find out how it went. Yeah, we got to see how he's healing up and hopefully we get some good news. I'm definitely hoping that. I mean, his first follow-up visit, which didn't have an x-ray, they said that it looked like it was pretty good. Yeah, they said it was healing up well. There was minimal swelling and like everything looks good. However, we did notice in the past couple of days he's not using his leg as much although he's back to using it more so now there's a couple of bumps on it everything is very confusing and <laughs> scary so I don't, I don't know like yeah we'll have to find out what the x-ray says tomorrow it's no life for a young pup it's no life for a young pup you know it's no he life got it, for any pup he got a bad genetic lot in life he did but thankfully he's here and you know he has people looking out for him so hopefully it all pans out hopefully it pans out yeah well we got new neighbors this week we did get new neighbors this week and i have to say i'm very thankful that they are mad cool yes it's always scary is, yeah the thing is neighbors can really make or break your quality of life absolutely i mean as you and i both know from past experiences bad yeah. neighbors can really affect your mental health <laughs> oh yeah you know your day-to-day -day existence can be plagued by bad neighbors yes most definitely so you know our former neighbors they were great two of our homies yeah and when we learned that they were moving out we were distraught because it's like a crap shoot now it's like all right who's gonna move in there are they gonna be as cool as you are they gonna be quiet are they gonna be respectful yeah you know noise is a big thing for me it is i can't you know i don't like hearing noise when i'm trying to sleep during the day whatever respectful hours it's all good but once it goes into that realm of being disrespectful like when it's dark people are trying to sleep shut the fuck up yeah just shut the fuck up but let me tell everybody how we immediately knew they were cool <laughs> yes so swasti was passing by their place when they just started moving some stuff in and she noticed their welcome mat yeah and what did it say it said no admittance except on party business and if you're a lord of the rings nerd like we are then you immediately recognize that phrase it was the sign on bilbo's house when he was preparing for his birthday party and it's just all facts it's all facts and so yeah as soon as we saw that we were like oh shit, this is our people and they are our people absolutely so we met him, super cool, crisis averted. Crisis absolutely averted. You definitely hear crazy stories about nutso people. All the time. We also had this week a bit of a mayfly, not an infestation, but they were all just chilling on the screen door and the normal door. And it was just like, what's really good here? Yo, yeah. Fuck mayflies. Truly fuck them. I know they don't like bite or do anything, but they're just like gross and small and they just fly around. I, I don't want them inside the house. No, it's a nuisance. It really is. I looked up what their purpose is and I guess like somehow they contribute to fishing season. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, all right. Well, I mean, do your thing then. Just not in my house. Yeah, just not fucking here. You know what I mean? You, there's no fish here. I mean, ladybugs are nice. La we did get a ladybug we inside. Got a ladybug, yeah. That was cute. And that was nice. I um, released said ladybug into a plant we have. Yep. And I think the ladybug was happy. I'm hoping the ladybug is still around. Bringing that good luck. Absolutely. We could use it. Yeah, because like, I don't really fuck with the mayflies. <laughs> you know we, we got a couple of spiders recently yeah yeah it's like heating up and they're trying to cool down is that what it is they're coming in for shelter i don't know i mean maybe so that's fucked up it is fucked up i don't know if anybody could hear olo through yeah. the mic but he has some thoughts and feelings as well yeah he de he also says fuck the mayflies he definitely says fuck the mayflies he's definitely going to be going off it sounds like he's got a lot to say this podcast he was doing a good bit of scratching in the crate yep now he's doing some shaking now he's doing some shaking that definitely came through i heard it nice all right, so this week we have a true crime case. And without further ado, let's talk about the serial killer sisters Renuka Shinde and Seema Gavit, who were active in Western Maharashtra in the early 90s. Oh, wow. Serial killers. Serial killers. I think this might be the first time that we've spoken about serial killers. It is the first time we've done that. It's kind of full circle for me because the way I kind of fell into true crime in general was when I started talking about South Asian serial killers on my TikTok account. And we're doing it here at the podcast now. That's right. Yeah. Some of your very early, like super viral true crime videos it was about serial killers yeah it was all serial killers and then people started suggesting true crime cases was the first one you ever did kimpama it was kimpama 
I remember that because of the amount of times, <laughs> the absurd amount of times that you said the name Gambama. Yeah, I said it quite a bit. It was like, truly take a shot every time I say this, you will die in like 30 seconds. <laughs> Alcohol poisoning <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking embarrassing. Yeah, we but should, hey, it did well. Whatever. We should we should insert a clip of it here. We should just so people can hear how just shambolic that was. <laughs> but yeah, this was especially interesting because it's serial killer sisters. I have to be honest. I don't know if I've ever heard that before. No, neither had I. It's a first for me as well. All right. So all the information I found on this case is from articles in OP India by Anurag, the APB News Bureau, the Medium by Sal, the Crime Wire by Ravi Rajan, the Hindustan Times, and the Indian Express. Trigger warning for the violent abuse and murder of children. And oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it had to go there? It had to go there. Jesus. Apologies in advance for any mispronunciations. Renuka and Seema were introduced to the life of crime by their mother, Anjana Bai. Who oh, wow. Yeah, right? Who turned to theft, most likely for survival, after her first husband, a truck driver, deserted the family after Renuka was born. Okay, so she wasn't serial killing. Not yet she wasn't. Oh, she was. Okay, and she, she started off with thievery. Yeah, she started off as like a petty thief. Okay. To feed her family. To feed her family, most likely. There's right. no like actual concrete proof as to why, but that's what we can surmise based right, on the right, circumstances. Right. Okay. Soon enough, Anjana became a hardened criminal with more than 125 cases of theft across multiple states in India. Damn. Mm -hmm. She married a retired soldier named Mohan Gavit with whom she had Seema, but he also left her because of her crimes. Oh, so they have two different dads. Yes, they have two different dads. Okay. These crimes resulted in repeated harassment from the police and he was done dealing with it. Mohan remarried as well and had children with his second wife. Anjana, who was bitter about Mohan leaving her, was hell-bent on revenge. She roped her daughters into her life of crime, often using Seema as bait. Renuka got married to a tailor named Giran Shinde in 1989. They continued stealing from people in public places, but eventually one of their theft attempts at a temple in Pune fell through and Renuka was caught. Hold up, so we're fast-forwarding quite a bit if the daughter is married now, right? Yes. So we're to assume that throughout their childhood... Them and their mother were stealing together. Sounds like as a trio. Yeah. She was using them for bait. Yes. She was using probably, Seema for bait. So when they were little, probably sending them up to people to be like, oh, hey, we're little kids. We need help. Yeah. Line them up. Exactly. Okay. How, Which is pretty common in India. You know, that happens a lot. Was she stealing or was she robbing? She was stealing. Okay. So she was stealing. Yeah. It was like pickpocket. Got it. Okay, so the kids would distract them and then she would pick Exactly. Pocket. That's happening throughout their childhood. Yes. And now they're growing up. One of them is married. Yes. And even though she's married, she's also continuing... This tradition. Do we know what her husband does for a living? He's a tailor. He's a tailor. Yes. Right, you said that. So are we aware as to whether at this point they are stealing because of need or have they just developed this habit that they cannot break? So there's not too much on that gap, basically. I think it's probably for survival because they were not very educated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if they're relying so the on one a tailor's that, income. I'm about to say the one that's married to the tailor, like, yeah, so his income is not enough to support them yeah. too? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the other sister's unmarried at this point. The other sister's unmarried at this point. Is the tailor aware of what they do? Yeah, he's going to be a part of it, actually. Oh, he's about to be he's a part of it. He's about to be their getaway driver, basically. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's like, this is like the family business. This is it. So this, we ended up with Renika getting caught. Her son, Ashish, who was a toddler at the time, had accompanied her that day. So she managed to think of a way to get out of the sticky situation by creating a scene and saying she was the mother of a small child and the mother of a small child couldn't possibly possibly steal hmm. mm -hmm. did that work yeah the crowd bought it and they let her go oh there was a whole crowd there was like basically it was like mob mentality right she got she was at a temple she tried to steal and then it didn't work and she was like well no actually i have this on here got it got it okay yeah. so she played upon people's sympathies exactly okay that's so disgusting to be doing this with your child with you it's so involving wild. a toddler in this even worse, her getting away and getting out of this because of having a toddler is what ends up giving the trio this idea to always have a child under five years old present when committing crimes. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. That is fucking vile. It's foul. And that's so that the child serves both as a foil and a distraction, helping them escape the scene easily with 
Buren as the getaway driver. Wow. So just just pure evil. Yeah, it's off like the rip. diabolical. Yeah. We went from stealing to involving children. Right. Because, you know, at the beginning, of, especially in a third world country, if you're stealing for survival, yeah, there is a moral justification there. Right? right. Because a lot of times, like I said, especially in third world countries, you really may not have another option. Absolutely. It really may be the fact that if you're not going to steal, you're not going to be able to feed your children. Yeah. But... Nothing justifies the capture of other children and the use of your own children to like in this sort of a vile sense. Yeah, you shouldn't be furthering your crimes using a child. Oh my God, hell no. It's just so wrong on every level imaginable. Okay, so at this point, there's no killing. Is that correct? At this point, there's no killing. That we know of. Yeah, there's just theft to support the family. Okay. The sister's first victim was an 18-month-old boy named Santosh, who was the child of an unhoused woman. In April 1991, they took Santosh to Kolapur, where Seema was caught and beaten while trying to steal a purse that belonged to a person visiting the Mahalakshmi temple. In an attempt to divert the attention away from Seema, Anjana Bai threw Santosh to the ground, causing him to sustain several injuries. What the fuck? Yes. So their mom, mm-hmm. that's Anjana's their mom, yeah, right? Yeah, Anjana's their mom, you're so right. So at this point, she's older. What it, can we assume what? 40s, 50s? I don't know. Um, I would say mid 40s. So her daughter is stealing somebody's purse mm-hmm. and to create a distraction, Yeah. she grabs an infant Yes. and throws him on the ground. Yeah, they had kidnapped this infant for this purpose from... Oh, previously? Yes, yes. Basically. I thought, okay, I thought he was just on the location or whatever with his mom. No, no. No, they kidnapped him. So it's even worse. Yeah, they kidnapped him and then they took him to do this. So their distraction was throwing a child on the ground. Yeah. And this kid died from that. Not from that. Oh my God. As the crowd went wild, Seema managed to escape with Santosh and Anjanabai. Santosh... She threw him on the ground and then picked him back up and yeah. got away? and dragged him off, basically. Oh my God. Yeah. I can't believe the crowd was not able to at least get this child away from her. They might have not even realized that he was thrown on the ground. You know what I mean? They probably just heard the fall. Oh, I see. Because they were already distracted by Seema's theft and her getting her ass beat. Right. And then they heard this child fall and start crying. And so then they all got away. And so they all got away. Santosh was bleeding profusely and crying, which worried the members of the family who were concerned they'd get caught. Anjanabai decided to silence him by bashing his head against an electric pole. Holy fucking shit. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. She just like zero to a hundred. This is where she went. Wow. So this is just pure evil. Absolutely. Fuck this lady. Yeah. Can we have a spoiler alert? Do these people meet justice? These people, yes. All of them? The three women. Got it. Not the getaway driver. Oh, he get, he's scot-free? Well, he flips, basically. Oh, so he gets a deal. Yeah, he gets a deal. But he was complicit in this shit, he no? He was, yes. All right, they shouldn't have given him any fucking deal they then. They shouldn't have. I, I was not expecting the story to go here. That is, again, next level. The, the, God. I mean, you know what's even more fucked up? They show no remorse. Why is that not surprising? Yeah. Shocking, not surprising. The theme of every true crime. Yeah. Every single time, it just the depths of evil that humans will sink to. Yeah. It's really something. It really is. Now, while Anjana Bai is bashing Santosh's head into a pole, everyone else in the family was eating varapau and just watching this happen. Everyone else being two sisters. And Kiran. Who's Kiran? The husband of Renuka. Oh, he's the he's the husband. Yeah. And where's the one of the sisters had a kid, right? Yes. Renuka has a son. I actually don't know where he is at this time. He could have been part of this. How old is he at this time? He's like a couple years old. Okay. Maybe a little bit older than a couple years old. But, you know, he's not like older. Right. Santosh died on the spot and they disposed of his body near an old rickshaw heap. The next day, Santosh's body was found and the matter was reported to the police, but the police couldn't find anything that traced back to the murderers. Between 1990 and 1996, the sisters took part in at least 40 abductions. They began to regularly kidnap infants and young children from overcrowded places like carnivals, parks, temples, and markets. Once the child had fulfilled their purpose, they were told to keep quiet, and if they dared open their mouths and share what they did or cry, they would be killed. So does that mean that there were some kids they were kidnapping and then releasing? Yes, that is exactly what that means. Okay. 
Now, they had a seven-month-old victim named Swapnil, and Seema dropped him because she, quote, couldn't deal with his incessant crying. Jesus. Another victim of a gruesome murder was a two-year-old boy, and he was starved, hung upside down, and they slammed his head against a wall repeatedly, and this was all because he cried for his mother. What the fuck? They chopped up the body of an 18-month-old girl and stuffed it into a bag oh, for disposal. Oh, my God. These... Jeez, they then, how was this able to go on for this long? Because these, I mean, children are ch children are turning up. I mean, babies are turning up dead, and people are not investigating this shit more seriously. Because I believe if they were reported, they had no trace. They couldn't find the bodies. So they were these, just missing. So these these people are just a whizzes with removing evidence. I guess they have figured out their way to do it. Slash, these could also be people who are unhoused. But still. Yeah. Like no DNA. No, Nothing. Never any witnesses, obviously, it sounds like. No. That's crazy. Yeah. This is just so disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really awful. Now, they took the bag with the body in it to the movie theater with them and watched a movie and ate palepuri with the bag laying by their feet. Fuck these people. So they are clearly disconnected from any sort of conscience. Yes. Right? I mean, they... Wow. They're awful. Awful people. And then they disposed of that bag in the women's bathroom in the what movie the theater. Fuck? How is it possible that a whole family of people are like this? <sighs> I wish I could tell you. You have to wonder what's... I don't know. I don't even know how to describe... Right? Because it's like... Like, is this inherited? Right, th I guess that's what I'm getting at. Like, is, is this evil nature inherited? Like, did these two inherit that? Or is it a nature versus... Nerd? Like, would they have been like that regardless? Or are they only like that because they were raised by their fucked up psychopath mother? Yeah, that's a really good question. But then one of them married a guy yeah. that was not part of their family. But when he came in, he was just like, oh, this is normal. Yeah, this is cool. This is what we do. Yeah. Does evil just attract evil? Is that why that happened? That's a great question. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to where to fucking begin with the analysis here like is it some sort of a fucking genetic defect that detaches one from conscience that's a good question i mean both of them when they are on trial later and being questioned and all they're completely stoic they show absolutely no remorse they do not give a fuck about what they did and they obviously these are cold calculated murders and they were all fine with it and look what they're doing it for too to steal a fucking purse yeah steal some gold jewelry like okay this is pathetic a one-year-old boy was killed by repeatedly hammering his head on a stony footpath while another child was inflicted with so 42 this is, wounds this is just their fucking mo that's what they do they yes. smash children's heads into walls and floors and whatever the fuck yeah this wow and they carved designs into another child who was four years old what the fuck yeah these are all very cold. This is just getting calculated. worse and worse. Yeah. Designs? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Another child was drowned by Renuka and Sima in their bathroom. One of the sisters held his legs to stop him from moving and the other one actively drowned him. Wow. Now, remember how Anjana Bai was pissed off at her second husband, Mohan, for leaving her? Way back when. Yeah, way back when. Mm -hmm. Well, she and her daughters decided it was time to make him pay. Oh, my God. So in October 1996, senior police officer Mandaleshwar Madhav Rao Kale was assigned to a case where a nine-year-old girl named Granti Gavit was kidnapped in Nasik. Kale, who had 36 years of experience in the force, did not expect to uncover a series of murders during this investigation. He said, Pratiba Gavit, the wife of Mohan Gavit, had filed a kidnapping case against her husband's first wife, Anjana Bai. Is that his new daughter? Yes. Right. His stepdaughter, Renuka Shinde, and daughter, Seema Gavit. Pratiba's nine-year-old daughter, Granti, had been missing, and she was convinced that these three women were responsible. And she was correct. Yes. Granti was killed, and her body was later found in a sugarcane field near Buna. As the investigation to find the murderers began, the family went underground. On November 19, 1996, they reappeared, however, and tried to kidnap Pratiba and Mohan's younger daughter, but they were arrested by the police. During the kidnapping? Yes. Like during the attempted kidnapping, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should they say? Were, yep. were the police laying in wait or what happened? So I'm not sure on the details there, but they were already aware that these were the suspected folks. Right. So they were like keeping an eye on the house is what I So this is when they finally got caught. Yeah, this is when they finally got caught. So not for any of the other crimes. It was for this. Right. 
A special investigating team visited their house in Nasik, where they uncovered evidence of many more kidnappings. They found discarded clothes of the children. Another piece of evidence they recovered were photographs of Renuka's child's birthday party in which non-local children were present. What does that mean? That at this birthday party were a bunch of kidnapped children? Yeah, because they were like probably holding them hostage, right? To like go through with the crimes and then either they let them go this or is, they dispose of them. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. The police discovered the petty crimes the women were involved in, but they did not know who the children were. The investigators found all three women as being particularly obstinate witnesses, especially Anjanabai. Eventually, Seema admitted to the kidnapping and killing of Granthi, but she said it was all done at her mother's orders. The three would later be charged with Granthi's kidnapping and murder, but not convicted. But not convicted? Yeah, lack of evidence. What? Mm-hmm. So they walked from those charges? From specifically, her her murder charge was dropped. But did they get brought up on other murder charges? Yes. Okay. Yes. So from this point that they got arrested here, they mm-hmm. did not walk free. They did not. They are now in custody. That's shocking. Yes. That part is shocking. Yeah. Because in every other fucking story that we've heard, the guilty party always walks free. Yeah. I mean, here, let's not speak too soon. Yeah. Who knows? They're going <laughs> to bring up know. a fucking appeal just like everybody else, right? They did bring up an appeal. Yeah. Classic. They did. Of course. Now, during the trial, it was noted that none of the women had shown any signs of remorse. They didn't have any reaction in the courtroom whatsoever. In December 1997, 50-year-old Anjana died while in custody as they were awaiting trial. The trial began in 1998 and continued for three years. The prosecution examined 156 witnesses during the trial. Its case was strengthened after Renika's husband, Kiran, who had also been arrested, submitted an application in the Nashik court seeking permission to turn witness in exchange for being pardoned. Did you just say over 100 witnesses were interviewed? Yeah, 156. So, so there were witnesses? I believe it was people after the fact and children who they let free. Got it. Kiran explained the chain of events and the roles played by Anjanabai, Renuka, and Seema, providing details regarding how the crimes were committed and where the bodies had been disposed of. For his cooperation, Kiran was pardoned by the court. That's poor. Yeah. I mean, I, I get how that system works, because if you didn't get him to talk, then maybe you wouldn't have been able to convict them. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, he's equally responsible. Even if he didn't take part directly in the murder, he was complicit in every single one, yeah, right? Yeah, he knew. I mean, yeah, at a bare minimum, he knew it was going on and did nothing to stop it. Absolutely. Knowing that it would happen yeah. again and again and again and again. Yeah. As indeed it did. So he's just as fucking guilty as they are. Absolutely. But yeah, like you said, I guess they had nothing. They had nothing. It's not, I guess, they truly had nothing because he was able to basically step by step what they did and where they disposed the bodies. It sucks that he was able to get a deal. I know. In the Sessions Court at Kolapur, the sisters were charged with 13 kidnappings and 10 murders. On June 29, 2001, the court found the sisters guilty of all the kidnappings, but only six murders, citing lack of evidence in the other four. The Bombay High Court upheld the conviction in its ruling on September 9, 2004, but acquitted them of one murder. They stated that, quote, the nature of the crimes and the systematic way in which each child was kidnapped and killed amply demonstrates the depravity of the mind of the appellants, the convicts. We have carefully considered the whole aspect of the case and are also alive to the new trends in the sentencing system in criminology. We do not think that these appellants are likely to be reformed. Are also what? Alive? Yeah. I think just aware is what they meant. It's probably a bad translation. Okay. The death sentence handed down by these courts was confirmed by the Supreme Court on August 31st, 2006. After the Supreme Court ruling, Seema and Ranuka filed a mercy petition on October 10th, 2008 and October 17th, 2009, A mercy petition? Yes. Their mercy, please. What does that even mean? Basically, like, them begging to not be given the death sentence please like have mercy on us is what it is whatever man after the president rejected their mercy pleas in 2014 they approached the bombay high court seeking commutation of their death sentence their petition sought to commute their original sentence to life imprisonment it stated that on august 28 2013 the governor of maharashtra had rejected their mercy plea and thereafter the file was forwarded to the central government to be submitted to the president of india the president of india decided on the pleas on july 7 2014 within 10 months of receiving 
receiving it. They contended that the president took an excessive amount of time to reject their mercy petitions when such a plea should have been disposed of within three months. They contended that, quote, the extraordinary and unjustified delay in execution on our death sentence has caused immense mental torture, emotional and physical agony to us. Immense quote. mental torture, emotional and physical agony to them. Yes. And, and wow, because they're living I'm, with the fear I of am dying. I am every just day. disgusted that they think that anybody should care as to what emotional and physical pain they are suffering yeah. after they spent a lifetime inflicting that upon children. Yep. It's so interesting how it's pathetic. The table fucking always turns with these assholes. That's unbelievable. Those were innocent children, and you are murderers. You deserve what you get. They also said that they had committed the crimes that they had been sentenced for at a relatively young age and had grown a lot since then. They also blamed abandonment issues for their actions as part of their defense while presenting the petition. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because any therapist can tell you that abandonment issues classically causes you to murder children apparently to these guys mm -hmm. they also believed they didn't deserve to be hanged as it was quote too barbaric the maharashtra home department maintained that there was no unreasonable delay on part of the state in forwarding their mercy pleas to the governor and the president of india the state's affidavit said quote whatever delay has been caused has occurred for complying with the procedure required to be followed at each level an affidavit filed by the central government, however, indicated that in April 2012, it sought information from the Maharashtra government on the mercy petitions filed by Renuka and Seema. The union's affidavit added a reply from the Maharashtra government dated May 2013, which stated that the file pertaining to the sisters' mercy pleas was destroyed in a fire that broke out on March 9, 2013, and work on recreating the file was ongoing. On January 18, 2022, the Bombay High Court commuted the death sentence of the serial killer sisters to a life sentence. Wow. What? Well if I'm being honest, I actually think that's worse. No, I, I agree. So unless, of course, they're living in a, some cushy fucking prison. I don't know. I doubt it. Sometimes that's the case. But if they just got them in gem pop. Well, I don't know, man, because I would th if they had them in gem pop, somebody would have probably fucking marked them by now. I don't know. Because like that's you would have to think that if they were in gen pop that there are correct because they're in an all women's prison. Yeah. Right. All women's prison, I would imagine, has at least a few mothers. Yes. Who there, will not be happy. Yeah, there have to be fellow prisoners that are not happy about what they did. Yeah. And think that they deserve to meet some fucking street justice. Absolutely. So maybe they're not in Gen Pop. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. The court cited the inordinate delay and indifference by the state government in dealing with their mercy petition as the reason for reducing the sentence. I can't even believe people bother with that shit, though. I know. Like, when you see a mercy plea come from these two fucking cretins, mm -hmm. right, you just fucking ignore it. Why are you wasting the court and the government's time with this type of shit? I mean, we already know that the court system over there and the justice system over there is more than overloaded. Yeah. And all the way fucked. Yeah. And y'all wasting time with this shit? Keep it moving. <laughs> I guess that's what they kind of tried to do because they were allegedly indifferent about it and but, delayed. But then they revisited. Yeah. I wonder if it was like, do they have to revisit it? Maybe that was, maybe the fire was like, oh yeah, let's burn this so we don't have to deal with it. And then people were like, nah, you got to get back to that. Pathetic. Like, I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works either. I'm just saying that I just can't believe that anybody bothered with this. I know. As of now, though, Renuka and Seema are in prison, and I'm hoping it stays that way. It's crazy that that last update was 2022. Yeah, that's... Remember how every case, 2022, 2023, people are going free. Yeah. We did fucked up shit. That's why I'm like, let's not hold our breath. This is a fucked up case. Yeah, it's definitely... I mean, every case. I can't believe up. how long this went on for. Yeah. And that the trial was three years. Took three years. Wow. And it sounds like their mom kind of got off easy. She did because she died. She just died while she was awaiting trial. She don't have to suffer now, no. which is what she deserves. Yeah. She just got off scot-free, basically. Man, I don't even know where to start. Like, I really just wonder over the time, like what people, because you, you really do have to wonder, right? With all the kids that they kidnapped, was it legit nobody knew? That's a good question. Right? I mean, did nobody see? Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe it was like, oh, we're going to mind our business. Yeah. 
Did every single kid that they release not say shit? See, I don't know. Maybe they did and it wasn't taken seriously. Right. Maybe they were traumatized and they didn't because they were like, these people might come back and kill me. I mean, and as a kid, that's understandable. Yeah. I, I wouldn't blame a released kid for not talking if they're just scared. Right. But I would imagine that some probably did. Right. And then if they did talk, why wasn't anything done at that point? Why, yeah. you know, what adult did they tell? I mean, did these kids have parents that got released? Yeah, I don't know. Who did they tell? And then people just probably were like, oh, fuck, I'm not going to, I don't care. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't see any details about that. And I was curious about that myself. Yeah, there's so much to wonder about in the interim because you really just have to wonder like what could have been done to stop this after the fucking first time the first time like was especially hard because it was a woman who was on house this was her son so she probably had no fucking idea and then the abuse that takes place within the unhoused community in India, she probably was just like, well, this is par of the course. Right, she probably had no recourse. Yeah, like, right? she, you, pro they, she probably not wouldn't seriously. have been taken seriously in a police station or anything. Definitely not. Man, that's really unfortunate. It truly is. It sounds like there were a lot of victims here. Yeah, I mean, there Do were at least 40 kidnappings. At least 40? At least 40 kidnapped children. And do you have a number for the murders? I don't. They actually don't know how many people they killed. Well, any murders is too many. Yeah. It's tough to fathom how a human being, or I should say a pathetic excuse for a human being, could be this evil, let alone stomaching the fact that it's three to four of them at yeah. once, consciously making the decision. Yeah. I mean, and in their right mind, in their right senses. Right. To continue committing these heinous acts again and again. Like you don't feel anything. And what's crazy is Ranika had children. Right. right. So I mean, like, Anjana had children. Yeah. Two of them that she turned into fucking psychopaths. Yeah. Wait, yo, what's going on with the kid? There's more than one kid by the time all of this ended. And only one of the children knew at the time that this is what their mom did. That she was like a murderer. And as of now, I'm not too sure what's good with them. I'm assuming they're fine, you know. I hope. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be psychologically damaging, especially on that first child who was involved in this. It's a shocking fucked up situation. I really want to know, like, at these birthday parties, like, what were these kids thinking? You know, because there's yeah. other kids. Right, yeah. I mean, they, they, they like the, their kids have to know that something is not right. Here's the thing. According to one article, only one of the kids knew what the mom was up to. Maybe that right. was this. Maybe that was the older one. Ma Ashish. Right, maybe. Obviously, I'm not contradicting that maybe the younger one didn't know. But right. the younger one had to have felt that something was... Because, like, let's say you kidnap children and you're like, all right, you're going to act happy at my kid's birthday party right now and not right. say shit. There's no way that these kids can actually do that, right? They're scared, yeah. but they're going to look worried. They're yeah. going to look concerned. They're not actually going to be happy and have a good time. They're not out there fucking playing, pin the tail on the donkey with smiles on their faces. Yeah, yeah, you're I mean, right. there's no fucking way. So yeah, it's just one fucking psychopathic situation in the house. So that means that both kids had to have felt something was off. You have to wonder what was really good with that, how they came out feeling in the end yeah and fuck the husband man fuck kieran yeah wherever you are i hope you're suffering absolutely you and your bitch ass deal i mean the only thing i have to say is which is kind of like the theme of every one of these true crimes is i hope everyone is vigilant yeah you know what i mean because i don't know man when they're kidnapping all these kids there i just feel like there has to have been moments when people could have understood that something wrong was happening right because if you think about it right it's kids how often are they just like by themselves in a lonely place mm -hmm. where nobody can see Mm -hmm. You know, like there had to have been signs, maybe not, I don't know, but I'm thinking that there had to have been signs from people that this was happening. So anyway, moral of the story, if there is one, is just to try to be vigilant. Always, of course, watch out for your kids, mm -hmm. but it, watch out for any kids in the neighborhood. Watch out for any kids that are around you, you know, just make sure that they're safe because there are fucking psychopathic predators out there. Absolutely. That do heinous shit like this. Yeah, we got to protect the kids. So we got to protect the kids. Just stay alert and hopefully we can prevent shit like this from happening again absolutely well i guess that about wraps it up for another episode of ectoplasm and evil we'll see you next time or will we ah. <laughs>